Um, thunderstorms or thunderbolts or whatever we're going to call them, um, followed by lightning. It's very, very frightening. Um, so first up, we, we're going, we've reduced the time slightly because I believe we have 40 minutes, possibly even less now. Um, so rather than 15 minutes each, every presenter has about 10 to 12. Um, so we're going to start up first with Morgan, who's going to be talking about virtual reality and being in cyberspace. Thanks. Hello. I'm Morgan, and though a few of you have met me now, you don't really know what I do. I'm not a programmer. Uh, I did a thing, and here is the thing, and because of the thing, I get to call myself Dr. Morgan Lee. Yay me. Um, I wrote a thesis which is entitled Virtually Real, Being in Cyberspace, and you can find it at the UTAS E repository, and it, you will find it under this license, which the university told me not to do. <laughs> but you paid for this thesis, for verily I received a scholarship from the federal government, so here it is. This is what you get for your money. Now this is very important. I need you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. I'm looking. I'm looking at you. I'm going to read you a thing. This thesis is an autoethnographic auto God, <laughs> autoethnographic account of my search for the sacred in cyberspace. You don't have your eyes closed. Research was conducted in the virtual world Second Life and in particular in two role play communities set in ancient Egypt. Virtual worlds are often criticized as unreal, as just games. Here I explore the ontological status of virtual worlds, recognizing the priority for their inhabitants of lived experience over purely rational assessment. Uh, I recount my experiences with ritual in cyberspace, describing sacred virtual space and its relationship to sacred meat space. Finally, I argue that there are many truths and that objectivity is impossible in the human condition. This is the story of how I became one with my avatar despite my best efforts not to do so. Themes of the fun economy, remix culture, and copyright inform the analysis of the thesis. Okay. Moving right along, we'll have a look at some of these things. Autoethnographic. Here's a big fancy word. And what autoethnographic means is that I did a study of some people, and it was a first-person study. Because I firmly believe that you, in order to study a thing, you must become the thing. Otherwise, it's about writing about goldfish by looking in a goldfish pond and going, that's what a goldfish is. Okay, So you must become the thing. And then this, I was informed by this chick, um, Jean Favre Sada, who in the uh, uh, 1970s studied the rural rich witchcraft practices of rural France. And some people will be going, oh, witchcraft, that's just bogus. But see what you've done there? You've immediately gone, that's just bogus. How can you study a thing if you've already decided it's bogus? So become the thing, embrace the thing, and do it. So I became this bloke. This is Kemetic Magic who was my avatar for my research period for about four years. I was a man for four years. Nobody guessed. Um, so the ethics committee um, didn't want me to be an equal with my uh, research people. They wanted to say that I had some kind of power because I'd be able to publish and write things about it. In fact, I said, I have less power than them because you won't let me write about this and this and this and this, and they all write about it on the web about each other every day. <laughs> Okay, ontological status of virtual worlds. Ontology is the study of being. What does it mean to be? Okay, the ontological spacious worlds and the priority for their inhabitants of lived experience over purely rational assessments. Uh, a famous Tasmanian philosopher said that virtual worlds are not independent worlds. They're not new frontiers. They're not anything. They just rely on meat space because if there was no meat space, you couldn't run a computer and there'd be no virtual world. Now, why that's kind of, kind of a, a very um, sensible sounding statement is completely wrong. Um, and virtual worlds are their own reality. 
And I'd like to mention, why do we have a phone? You think, why is there a phone? Um, a couple of us talked about this earlier. When the word, the word phony comes from, when a telephone first arrived at the beginning of the 20th century, people characterised conversations over telephones as not authentic. It was just some strange thing you did, and it wasn't real, okay? And it, so it was phony, okay? So that's why games... So now, if someone says to me, virtual worlds aren't real, I go, a telephone conversation's real? And they go, oh, of course, it's just a conversation over a phone. <laughs> uh-huh. No, 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 no. No. That's, yep, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, this one, fun economy. Uh, and a nice man called Edward Castronova wrote a book called Exodus to the Virtual World, where he kind of very enthusiastically went, we're all going to move to virtual worlds, we're all going to go there, meet space will be dead, we all want to do it because it's awesome. No, can't handle that. But he says, the amalgam of work, play and education which characterises 21st century life in the developed world. What he means by that is... Why do people go and hang out in virtual worlds all this time and build ancient Egypts and do all this shit? Because they're not happy with the meat space world, okay? There's things about the meat space world they don't like, but they have a feeling that they have no agency to change the meat space world. They can't get rid of their politicians who invent awful asylum seeker policies. They can't do these things. So they're going to have a brave new world just like our ancestors came to Australia because it was a brave new world, humans like to be able to have frontiers. We have no more frontiers on our planet. Virtual worlds are our frontiers where we can go and do all these things that people don't want us to do. And when we got there, we discovered that people build things in Second Life and everybody wanted to enforce copyright on them. And we're like, oh, let's have copyright. But they found that profit wasn't the reason that people was building all these things in Second Life. They weren't all sitting there going, some of them were going, I'll build things, I'll sell them. Yeah. But most of the people who build things were like, I'm going to be, build this cool thing and I'm going to share it with my friends. And I don't want money, I don't want a permission system. So the fun economy is that world where you live in an economy where everything is designed to be fun. Gaming, people want people to stay in their gaming world, so if there's bugs, they fix them. They make things like you want them to be, as a huge contrast to politics, where if you want something changed, they don't change it. So political agency is one reason why we go in the fun economy. If it's not fun, we leave. I'm hoping politics becomes like the fun economy. Um, this one, restrictive copyright laws. Um, the entirety of human history has been a process of remixing the knowledge and stories of those who came before us and combining it to form new ways of understanding. We tell the stories of our forebears, but we embellish and extend and edit them. By trying to prevent us from remixing, from telling our stories, contemporary corporations are, seek, are seeking to prevent the development of culture. I have a theological argument against copyright. I bet none of you have ever thought of one of them because I am really a theologian. Um, if you want to, to be the best thing you can be, if you want to create yourself as the best person to emulate the divine, as I would say, if you want to be the best thing, you need access to the best information to become that thing. If you want to become the best programmer, you need access to the best docs with the most accurate information if you want to do that. At the moment, we're spending a lot of money paying a lot of very smart people to write a lot of papers that nobody can read because they're behind paywalls, because they have been uh, expected, as I was when I finished my thesis, to give it for nothing to an academic publisher who would then sell it back to the institution that paid me to do it so that they could have it in their library where nobody would read it because there would be one copy. Okay? So I, however, am extremely optimistic because looking back over the vast history of humans, I have seen that if there's one thing you can't do to humans, it's stop them producing culture. Okay? That is it. Thank you. I am done.
Nine minutes 35. There's probably a couple of, t uh, a couple of minutes for questions if anybody has them. This isn't a question. It's a comment. That was awesome. I have a question. What are you going to do next with virtual worlds? And what am I going to do next with virtual worlds? It seems that the winning thing I'm going to do is, thank you, produce, I don't know if you guys know, but Tim and I are lucky enough to live on 25 most beautiful acres in the world, in the Huon Valley, and where we farm lots of exciting animals, pigs, sheep, chickens, and soon a cow. Um, so, <laughs> and so what I plan to do is make a simulation of our farm, a real-time virtual world simulation, and put sensors in my animals, put microchips in my animals, so that as they're walking around the farm, I can go, I can sit in my house and go, oh, that sheep has not moved for three hours. I better go and see if it's lying on its back with its legs in the air. Okay. So if anybody's interested in this project, tell me, because first of all, I need to select an appropriate network transport to give me real-time coverage of little chips implanted in my animals that don't run out of battery power, over 25 acres. You get the picture. Talk to me about it. It'll be awesome. Um, thank you, Morgan, again. Thank you. Next up, we have Claire, who's going to be talking to us about skulls, human ancestors. Okay, um, I decided to talk to everyone about our family tree because there were lots of people interested after I talked about what we're doing with showing kids the skulls in schools. And some people were asking me about some of the latest fossils that have been found, so I thought I'd whip through some of that really quickly this afternoon. So just in brief, um, this is what part of our family tree looks like. That's all of us in this room, in case anybody had any doubts. Um, so we're going to be looking at a few of these in a bit more detail. First question to ask is, what makes us human? Um, people get terribly excited by the fact that we share 98.8% .8 of our DNA with chimpanzees. But just to put that in perspective, we share 50% of our DNA with a banana. So um, that includes things like protein degradation and how we deal with oxygen and all those sorts of things. So yeah, obviously us, the chimps and the bananas are all alive here and now. Um, so none of us descend from each other. As I said, my pet peeve, we do not descend from chimps. We have common ancestors, even with bananas. We are, by definition, related to all life on Earth, except viruses, who are really are aliens that invade. But that's a side issue. So if you look at this one just quickly, phylogeny is the fancy name for making family trees. Down in the bottom right corner is us. We're part of the animal kingdom. And you can see how we're related to fungi, who are a distant cousin, and amoeba, and then bananas. So, yeah, it's all there. Now, how we draw these family trees depends on how you see the universe. And so y there's pretty much a different family tree for every paleontologist and researcher in this area. And it boils down to whether you're a lumper or a splitter. And basically, lumpers like to put everything together and make one nice, neat, long tree and splitters like to go out sideways, which is kind of what you can see in this slide. So splitters will have a different branch of the tree for every single fossil. Lumpers will tend to push everything together and who knows, somewhere in between. What are we doing with this? We're actually looking at primarily comparing the skulls. We do compare other bones too, but we get the most information out of the skulls. So this is a modern human skull, which is in the bottom right of this. Again, the gorilla's there 
not because we descend from a gorilla, but to look at how the gorilla compares with other ancestors as well. Um, we're looking at things like the forehead, because development of the forehead is the prefrontal cortex, analytical thinking. We're looking at um, brow ridges, whether or not they're there. You can feel your own head, rub your hands over your eyebrows. If there's a ridge of bone there, you've got a brow ridge. We're looking at chin. Um, as you can see, most of human ancestors didn't have a chin, so it's a fairly modern thing. We're looking at the shape of the jaw when looked viewed from underneath. Um, you can see in the top right that the gorilla's got a very U-shaped jaw. Humans, that U opens up and becomes flatter. Um, so um, those are the kind of two modern extremes of jaw shape, and we look at how the ancestors fit in with those. Okay, so if we leap back to one of the earliest ones, this was found fairly recently um, in the 2000s in Chad. Um, Sahel Anthropus, which means man of Chad. Um, the Sahel is the region just south of the Sahara, um, and that's where they happened to find this individual. It did not have a face that was squashed over to one side. That's happened after it was lying in the ground for a long time. About 7 million years old. This is definitely, well, as definitely as we can say, a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Um, very small brain case. Now, the things we need to do here is line up the eyes. You can see the total lack of forehead, okay? And if we flip it over this way, if you feel with your, your fingers just next to your eyes here, it's pretty much full, okay? These guys, it wasn't. There's a big space. And that's the thing we'll see changing over time, that and the forehead. I will pass this around for you to have a look at. Also, the general shape, you can see we've really filled out that brain case. And these guys were still really getting to that. Um, jaw shape is a bit more parallel on the sides. I'll pass that around. Everyone can have a look. OK. Um, the next one that I'll talk about, I don't have a fossil of it to hand around, but Ardipithecus ramidus, it's about four or five million years, possibly still an ancestor with chimpanzees. Um, again, still a very small brain case. Australopithecus afarensis, the most famous one was Lucy, uh, found in 1974, about three to four million years ago. Um, I don't, also don't have a, one to hand around of that. Again, we've still got this small brain case. What's interesting with afarensis is we believe we have footprints. They're most likely afarensis. Uh, two individuals walking next to each other, a large one and a smaller one. We know at this time there was sexual dimorphism, so the large ones are male, the smaller ones are female. And another one walking behind in the larger one's footsteps. Uh, to me, that's parents and the teenager trailing at the back. Um, but that's just an interpretation. Okay, Australopithecus africanus. Very similar time period to Afarensis, but in southern Africa. The most famous is the Taung child, for which we've got the brain case here. Again, line up the eyes, and you can see a start of a forehead, but not too much. Jaws still sticking out the front. Then we've got an interesting one. We've got a what we call the dead cousin, Paranthropus boisei. This is a side arm on the family tree that never went anywhere. So very parallel jaw, no forehead to speak of at all. Huge jaw muscles that attach to a ridge of bone on the top of the skull. Um, bigger cranial capacity, but didn't end up helping in the end. Their line did not make it. Uh, then we've got Homo habilis, which is the first one that's given the name of Homo. Um, or which is Homo sapiens, we ultimately end up there. This is about two million years ago. Stood about a meter tall. Cranial capacity is getting larger. Line up the eyes, still not a lot of forehead happening there. And um, yeah, it's hard to see from this, but the, the jaw is starting to open out a little bit. Okay, Homo erectus. This one here in Africa, they sometimes called Homo ergaster, depending which camp you're in on that one. Um, these guys were the most successful in our family tree. They were around for about a million years. That is tremendously successful, way more successful than we've been so far. If you line up the eyes, still not a lot of forehead happening there. Very big brow ridges. 
Um, the jaw is becoming much more like modern jaw, but basically it's still not happening in the uh, rational thinking area. As you can see, they're getting closer in size to what people are these days and starting to look like um, members of a rugby team, that sort of thing. Okay, um, I'll hand around the modern human for comparison. You may have heard about the hobbits. These are um, fossils that were found relatively recently by an Australian Indonesian team uh, just in Indonesia. They stood about a meter high. Interestingly enough, they seem to be a separate diversion from Homo erectus. So uh, we developed from Homo erectus. Uh, this seems to be a side branch that again didn't go anywhere but hung around until relatively late. The small size is possibly to do with where they were, the island phenomenon. They hunted these tiny elephants. Um, Homo naledi is the one that there's been recent excitement about. It was found by cavers in 2013. It was found down a shaft in a far distant chamber of a limestone cave area, something called the Chamber of Stars, from which it gets its name. They now know there's about 15 individuals in those um, fossils. Unfortunately, they found in mixed sediments. And since we date everything from this time period because it's beyond the range of radiocarbon dating, since we date things from the sediments, that makes it really, really tough. At the moment, they're looking at the anatomy and saying it's most consistent with between the end of Africanus, uh, Australopithecus Africanus and Afarensis and Homo habilis, so something in between there. There's also been a lot of discussion in the media about the fact that these were intentionally buried and there's modern behavior because people were disposing of their dead in a cave. It's probably two million years old. The fact that the cave looked like it does now is extremely unlikely. And there's a range of natural events that can lead to a whole lot of fossils being deposited in one area. So most scientists are being a bit cautious about this. This is intentional burial. It's very early. And I, I don't have a skull of that one either, but again, very small brain case. So just quickly whipping through Neanderthals, that is a, um, an adaptation for cold, basically. They were around at the height of the last ice age, had a huge nose so they could warm up the air before they breathed it in, short bodies to uh, survive their rigors of living in an ice age. They probably interbred with people. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. You can hear. While I set up, I'm just going to hand over to Tim to take a couple of questions. Questions? Claire, I think you said that the hobbits were hunting small elephants. How, how do you know what they were doing? How do you know that they did that? Um, they have found with uh, the bones of those elephants in the cave, and I believe there's also cut marks. They did use stone tools. So where you've got uh, bones of a human ancestor, you've got stone tools and you've got cut marks on the bones of something else, we infer that they were eating them. Yeah. How big were those elephants? What is a miniature elephant? <laughs> I believe they stood about yay high. So they really were tiny. And the people were only a meter high, so kind of scales, I guess. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering whether you do the same thing with parallel evolutions, like let's say something else that has a decent brain capacity like dolphins or something like that. Do you still go back through their tree of... Yeah, sweet. Just want to talk into my side again. Interestingly enough, dolphins come from a kind of bear wolf thing that ran around on land and decided to stuff this and went back into the sea. Cool. Thank you again. You good, Ben? I'm posing. Oh, awesome. Hi, Jack. So I have less than 12 minutes now. Thank you. And I want to talk to you about five eyes. Hands up if you've not heard of five eyes. OK, this talk is especially for you. Um, so I was asked to talk about five eyes in five minutes. And in fact, this talk is called Five Things About Five Eyes in My Click Is Not Working. Five Things About Five Eyes in Five Minutes. And the last time I gave it, it actually took 15 minutes. And I've got less than 12. So let's see how we go with this. So 
One thing that I want to do is use a little bit of code, so I'm going to use PHP to describe exactly how um, Five Eyes operates. So I'm taking a, a list of all the members of Five Eyes, and I'm going to sort them by the lesser of two evils, where the definition of evil is string length. So we have Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and the United Kingdom. They are the members of Five Eyes. Um, so if anybody wasn't aware, Five Eyes was actually established just after World War II. Um, for those of you who do know about Five Eyes, it's actually only really been in the mine shaft for the last maybe five years or so. Um, it started just after World War II um, when the UK and the USA got a pact together and they had the U UK USA agreement. And in fact, there were like seven or, or eight different uh, countries that were part of that agreement. And then a couple of years, uh, about nine years later, they in introduced Canada, NZ, um, and Australia as well at which point they called themselves Oskansukusus. And that kind of didn't really roll off the tongue, so they went for Five Eyes. Um, I suspect that if Five Eyes had, a, oh no, before I go into the logo, um, so this is the Wikipedia article. If you look at the, um, the, the scroll bar here, I'll just go and point to the scroll bar over this side. The scroll bar here, it's, it's quite a long scroll bar. There's not much to scroll. That's the last human update. There were about two or three updates in between then and 2004. Uh, 14, uh, they were made by bots, but on 2014, the scroll bar is bloody tiny because there's a whole lot of information that's been added in. And part of that information, so I don't know if you know, but ASIO are not allowed to spy on us, um, but the, F, uh, the NSA are. So there's a little bit in there that they are intentionally spying on, another uh, on one another's citizens and sharing the collected information with each other in order to circumvent restrictive dom domestic regulation on spying. There's regulation to protect us. They're circumventing it. That sounds really good, right? So if they had a logo, I suspect it would look something like my clicker stopped working again. A um, bit of PHP script. It would look something like that. Um, however, if you look at the initials on the left-hand side here, I suspect that they'd probably get away with having a logo something a little bit more like that, and it's a whole lot less fucking scary. Um, so if there's anybody here from any of the Five Eyes um, organizations, please feel free to use that. It's uh, released under CC0. You don't even have to attribute me. Please don't attribute me. So they un intentionally undermine security. This is a security agency that's supposed to be looking after us, right? But they intentionally undermine security. Has anybody ever heard of Clipper Chip? Hands up if you have heard of Clipper Chip. OK, about 20, 30 percent of you. Clipper chip is basically a little chip that they were going to put inside computers and uh, phones. And it was an intentional backdoor. They actually went to uh, Congress and said, we want to put this in because it will help us keep people safe, because we can listen in on calls, and we can read the emails and all of these things. So um, uh, Rolling Stones magazine had a photo uh, which had all the keyboards unplugged, because they were like in those days, the keyboards were the computers. So they unplugged all the keyboards. They unplugged the phone. And uh, over there, you can't quite make it out. There's even a photo of a passport. I'm not sure how, quite how that's relevant. Um, but basically, Clip, Clipper Chip was supposed to be an intentional and um, publicly known backdoor into all of our communication systems, which, a um, bit more PHP script. Um, so EFF and Epic started up around that time, um, and they really got, into, got some traction because of Clipper Chip, um, so kind of backfired on the NSA a little bit. Um, and also, three uh, security privacy enhancing pieces of software were d developed in order to combat Clipper Chip specifically. And we've got United States Journey General, uh, Attorney General down here. Um, does anybody here not know uh, George Brandis? OK, good. Uh, that'll save me a bit of time. So this is their equivalent of George Brandis back in the time when Clipper Chip was around. And he said, absolutely not. It's not going to happen. I can't imagine George Brandis ever, ever actually standing up for us. Um, so I, I really like this Attorney General. And also the Secretary, Secretary of State at the time was also not on board with this. Um, so what else have they done? So NIST, the National Institute of uh, uh, something, something Technical, <laughs> they come up with standards. Um, one of the standards they come up with is in encryption um, algorithms. So the National Security Agency sent NIST a flawed random number generator. They intentionally flawed the number generator so they could predict the number that was supposedly random. The thing is with uh, cryptographic security is if you can predict the random number, then it's no longer cryptographically secure. So what they did was they, uh, they, they sent the flawed um, random number generator to NI NIST, who adopted it fully without even checking the, the, the code. Um, there, there was no um, pair programming or anything in those days. There might have been. Um, so there's a company called RSA. Uh, they're fairly well-known, security agency. They had a, uh, not security agency, but a, like a company who works in security products. Um, they had a product called Be Safe, which presumably helped people be safe. However, Be Safe was intentionally using the slower known flawed random, random number generator. There were four other options which were faster and known not to be flawed. A um, bit more PHP script. Um, also, uh, tangentially, um, the NSA also gave a, uh, the RSA $10 million. That's all I'll say about that. Um, does anybody recognize this logo? Yes. Does anybody know when Heartbleed came out? April 2014. Does anybody know when it was actually first, uh, the vulnerability was first used? 
five minutes. All right, I'm going to go really quick. So basically what happens is that um, it sends packets to a server in order to get more information out of it so that hopefully around the space in memory that your um, web server is running, you'll be able to get the key out. If you can get the SSL key out, then you've got the unencrypted, because it's in memory already key, and therefore you've got access to servers. It was actually, there was evidence of use of this um, about five months before it was actually... Yeah, five or six months before it was actually disclosed. And the IP addresses that this, these uh, evidences of abuses came from came from IP addresses that had similar traits to uh, botnets that were used by intelligence agencies. So there's a fairly high level of confidence that the NSA or one of their counterparts was actually exploiting Heartbleed before it was publicly announced. What kind of security agency will know about a vulnerability and not help people patch it intentionally in order to spy on its own people? An evil one. So... Uh, there is a reason that they do all of these kind of things. Uh, they want to have a backdoor because allied agencies can also get access into, to information. Therefore, they can keep us more secure. Also, enemy intelligi intelligence agencies, commercial competitors, identity thieves, crackers, and everybody else can also use these backdoors. So it's not a very good idea to actually keep them open. So in all good uh, intent, they should actually tell us about this and close them up. Uh, New Zealand. I, was, I gave this talk in New Zealand, first of all, and I wanted to find out exactly why New Zealand was a member of Five Eyes, because, you know, they're quite small, they're quite safe. Why would they? So they, they call it a cost of being a member of Five Eyes because they then get security information from the other countries. What is that cost to New Zealand to being a member of this? Well, what they do is they spy on their neighboring islands, their friendly neighboring islands. All of the people who apparently um, have status ally are near them, except Australia, and they basically add a listener and send the information out to all the other people that want to know information about them. So they do this in order to be a member. I'm not quite sure what the value is, but a lot of the neighboring islands weren't very happy when they found out about this, as you can probably imagine. Has anybody heard of Badass? I love the way, so this was um, created by GCHQ, who are the, um, the British equivalent of ASIO, and um, I can't remember the name of the Canadian equivalent of ASIO. They came up with this product and they called it Badass. I love the fact that security intelligence agencies are calling things Badass. So essentially, hands up if you've got that super duper must have app on your phone. Hands up if it's a cloud-based solution. It talks to another system and sends information to web servers, probably over HTTPS, because that's a good idea, right? And it's also got little adverts down at the bottom there, because, you know, they need to make money somehow. Yep. Hands up who's got one of those. Okay. Um, hands up who knows that the adverts are being requested over anything other than HTTP. There's significantly fewer hands. So um, Badass will basically tap that HTTP connection, get all the information that's going to the advertising companies, and log it directly with the security agencies. And that kind of information includes device platform, unique identifier, IMEI, and in some cases, even lat long. That's not theoretical. There are actually applications out there that do that. Um, NSA, they want to spy on people. They want to spy on people who don't want to be spied on. There are lots of people who don't want to be spied on for various reasons, either nefarious or otherwise. So what they do is they go to places like Skype, Google, and Facebook, and they say, we want you to give us all the information you have about these people that we want to spy on that we can't spy on because they're not making it very easy for us to spy on them. And it's, uh, Google, Facebook, and Skype all say, well, you know, that's not really nice because they're our customers and we like them and we, do, and, and we keep telling them that we're not sharing this information, um, but they are sharing this information. And you have to think to yourself, why are they telling us they're not sharing the information when they are and why are they lying to us? Well, the whole point, the, the whole reason behind that is the United, court states, the United States court system. They have a secret appeals system whereby uh, the NSA can go to... Um, the secret court, I can't remember its name at the moment, and basically say, we want information from these guys, and the secret court will then issue a warrant to Google, for example, and say, you need to provide them with all this information. And you're not allowed to tell anybody that you received this warrant. You're not even allowed to tell the person whose information is being requested that uh, that, that information has been requested. Um, if they do, my clicker stopped working again. If they do, they can be fined $250,000 per day or imprisoned. And this isn't Google. This is the directors of Google. It goes directly, like, they suspend the, the whole um, hierarchy of companies that generally protect directors. Directors can actually be directly sued for breaking this agreement or breaking the, the terms of the warrant. Now, one of the most interesting things about this, and this kind of sums up the five things, I added an extra one in for New Zealand. Hands up if you're from New Zealand. Okay, so... Um, this is probably going to happen in Australia soon because um, we're getting similar kind of regulations through. But about two months ago, there was this thing called My Clicker Stopped Working. It's, it's an awesome app. You, you should get it. There was this thing called the Health and Safety Reform Bill. Hands up if you've not heard of the safety, Health and Safety Reform Bill of New Zealand. Most people don't read these bills. Um, so the, National, uh, the New Zealand Law Society, after reading this bill, said that it potentially allowed a person to be tried of a criminal offence without seeing all the information relied on by the Crown and without the right to even be present. Welcome to the United States of Five Eyes. Um, I've probably used up all of my time. Uh, 
Otherwise, I would have gone into the Irma Gerd, what can I do about it? But instead, I would like to just encourage you all to, all to come up to me after this um, and have a chat and see if there's anything we can do about it, because you know there probably isn't, because um, we're up, up Shit Creek up without a canoe. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. That was excellent um, and terrifying. Deeply, deeply terrifying. Um, we're on morning tea now, but um, Russell Upton, give a quick talk, please. Okay. Let's be very quick. Okay. Firstly, um, all the talks at this conference have been really great. And uh, one thing I'd like to see is the people who've offered talks for this conference to offer talks to your local lugs. For those of you who aren't from Tasmania, there's probably a local uh, Linux user group uh, for you that's uh, considerably closer and easier to get to than uh, this place. So please consider offering the talk again. Uh, one of the, the speakers here said that he thought his talk wasn't uh, Linuxy enough for, for a Linux user group. And I'd like to say, no, that's not the case. Because uh, actually, with Linux user group means you have lots of uh, variety in the talks uh, presented. You only need to have a, you know, a relatively a small connection to uh, Linux and free software in general to be uh, relevant enough to, to uh, you know, be accepted. And also, just, uh, you just leave the uh, decision about whether your talk is relevant enough to the committee of, of Linux user groups. So you make an offer. If they say, you know, you, you make an offer and say, hey, I'm not sure if this is relevant enough, but if you'd like it, I'll, I'll do it. And let the, the committee decide whether you know, they like it enough. And um, also another thing, uh, with Linux user Victoria, we're doing a lot of hands-on talks. Uh, we've got a, a, a training facility available, so we do hands-on uh, tutorials. Things like uh, Donna's uh, great uh, uh, tutorial on Inkscape, that would go really well at a, a Love Beginners meeting. So Donna, if you want to do that, uh, please, uh, you know, the, if, if, not uh, Inkscape? OK. Maybe it was before I started going to those regularly. Because I've been going to those for about a year, so maybe it was about more than a year ago. Um, maybe there's an op option for a, a more advanced Inkscape that you could do. Anyway, there's lots of possibilities. So uh, please, everyone who's given a talk here, uh, please consider it. And also, the delegates who aren't speakers, uh, I, I know a bunch of you from you know, other conferences. I know that uh, you've got uh, interesting things you can talk about and teach, teach people about. So even if you didn't give a talk here, just think about you know, what can you do for your local lug, because we often have uh, trouble finding good speakers. And this is a room full of good speakers. So please consider what offer you make. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, OK. Afternoon tea. <laughs> uh, um, and I'm back in here at 20 past the next hour, whichever hour that is, <laughs> would be great. Uh, one last thing before you go. I know you've got that look in your eye. Remember, we're having the silent auction for the amazingly awesome geekos to support the refugee fund. So there's post-it notes over there by the cauldron. There's at least one post-it note in the cauldron, so yay. Whoever writes down the most money on the post-it note gets the geekos. You know you want them.